we are today. We get to be together today. Welcome to all you 11 o'clock people. So glad you're here today. I love being a part of City Point Church. Thanks for, thanks for being a, a part of this. If you're new, uh, I'm glad you're here too. As you're, you're, you're our guest, and we, pray, we praise God for that. It's wonderful. But I, I'm just glad to be a part of what God is doing in us and through us. As Jordan said, this is our Missions Expo. Kicked it off last night. The theme, hard to miss, accelerate. And I want to give you our big idea right up front. It, it is kind of the big idea for the whole expo. But it really is, it comes right out of our text this morning. Those of us that are part of City Point Church, we know it, it's the Bible that governs these things for us that we, as Allison prayed, we, we sit under the Word. We're, we're, we're students of the Word of God, and we believe that God works by His Word and His Spirit in us and through us to carry out Jesus' mission. So here's our big idea, that we, you and I, accelerate, that's the word, right? We accelerate Jesus' mission by supporting those engaged in it. Now, we're going to work through the text, which is in the book of Titus today. We're taking a, a short hiatus from the, uh, the study through the, the letter to the Hebrews, which is what we've been in since uh, earlier this year. We're going to take a short break on that. Today, we're going to be in the book of Titus. And this is what we see in this text. So it's not just a theme that, that we accelerate Jesus' mission by supporting those who are engaged in it. So we probably know what an accelerant is, right? We get, it, get this idea. An accelerant is a substance that furthers something else, like it, it speeds up the process of something else. So remember, for those of you that are adults, remember when you're a kid, those of you that are kids, you can like remember it like right now. It's amazing when you get a new pair of shoes, how much faster you can run and how much higher you can jump. Right? I think that's more of an, a psychological accelerant. I don't think they actually do that. But, you know, if it works, that's great. But, a, like, here's an accelerant. Uh, gasoline is a real accelerant. Like, that is a substance that speeds up the process. Whatever's burning burns faster when gasoline is applied, which, unfortunately, the guy in this video, it's like as soon as you see it start happening, you just want to push pause. Whoever's filming it, push pause and go... Don't let him do this. He has no idea what he's about to do. But here it is, right? Gasoline can. Yeah, with a little stout, super smart. And, and, yeah. You've got to see it twice. You want to take this in twice. So they turned the film off then. Jeez, we want to analyze these things and help these people. But that's an accelerant, right? So the fire's going, pour some gas on it, speeds up the process. Ay, 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 not good. All right, so here we are in the book of Titus. It's one of the pastoral epistles. So it's written by the Apostle Paul. He's writing to this younger man named Titus to instruct him on his pastoral duties, what he was supposed to do carrying out his work as a pastor among the churches in this region or in this area that he's in. Chapter 3, where, where our text is going to be, chapter 3 is um, some very important instruction. We're going to get to that in a moment. But just so we have our, our bearings about us, this man named Titus is an apostolic delegate. The Apostle Paul, under Christ's authority, has appointed Titus to be a pastor in a bit of a kind of a superintendent role on the island of Crete, which is in the Mediterranean Sea. And on this island, there are, I think at this point in history, they tell us there are roughly 20 uh, communities or towns in this, on this island. And so we don't know how many churches were on the island at this moment, but when Paul writes to Titus, he writes about the plural churches, so there's more than one local church on the island, okay? So we, we get that so far so good. Paul writes to him, as he says in the first chapter, to put in order. He's saying, I'm, I'm leaving you there in Crete so that you're, you're going to do these pastoral duties of putting things in order that still are undone in that church, which, of course, 
anybody that's been around church for a while knows that there's always things undone. There's always things that need to be worked on. There's always improvements and refinements and such. So this is Titus's job. And he's told that he is to appoint elders in each of those churches. And however many we, there were, we don't know, but it's plural. So in our section, in, in, in the letter, Paul is putting it to Titus. This is, catch this. He's putting it to Titus to do something in these local churches that reaches beyond the local churches. Right? There's, there's some people who have a kind of a myopic view of the mission of God, and they think, well, this is, uh, it, it's, it's me individually or it's us locally, and this is what we need to pay attention to, but that's not actually a very biblical mindset. Like kingdom-oriented, kingdom-minded people don't do this, they do this, right? Because when you do this, this gets taken care of as well. But when you do this, this doesn't get taken care of. And, and then we miss the heart and the will of God. And so he's saying, I want you to do something in these local churches that will reach beyond, extend beyond these local churches. So to lead the churches, that what he's putting him to is to lead the churches to be a part of what these two men named Zenos and Apollos were doing to be a part of what they were doing in carrying out the mission of Christ. And so the church's collective effort, that's, that's a key here, the church's collective effort would somehow accelerate the work of Zenos and Apollos. So let's read our text. Chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Only two verses today. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Let's pray about this. Father, as we've read this, um, I pray for us that each one of us would be uh, in a place where we could um, shut out any distractions. We would be attentive to what your word is saying to us. We ask for your Holy Spirit to lead us, give us ears to hear, to take in what you're saying to each of us and to us as a church today. We submit ourselves to you in that way and ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, one of the lines here in verse 14 is this idea of learning to devote ourselves to good works. And I want to make sure that we grasp this idea because there are some... Uh, there's some people who get a little bit hung up on this idea of good works because, because they understand that we are not in any way contributing to our salvation by way of good works. And so, which is, that is a very biblical understanding. That's sound soteriology, doctrine of salvation, is that Human beings do not in any way contribute to um, their, their own redemption, their salvation. It is a work of God alone in a person's life. But sometimes people get so hyper-focused on that that they miss that the Bible actually does call people to do good works, right? So five times in the letter to Titus, Paul has good works in, in, in his writings. There's three chapters as we have have it broken up, and, and first chapter he mentions it one time, second chapter he mentions it two times, and in the third chapter he mentions it three times. This idea that believers are to be devoted to good works. Now, the Apostle Paul, of all people, is clear that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Of all people, he is most clear about that, but of all people, he also writes about good works. But let's look at this. Just earlier in the chapter, he gives us one of the most, I think, clearest and profound statements about our salvation in this regard. Verse 5 of chapter 3, it says that God saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So we get this, right? We have, we have to understand that it's God who saves us, that it's not by our works. There's nothing that we can do to contribute to that. But his point here in all of this letter and in our text is having been saved by the mercy of God and by the grace of God, 
a believer can't help but engage in good works, right? We are, we've been brought into the family of God, and then God gives us His Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit resides within us. The Holy Spirit enlivens us to the things of God, to the mission of Christ, and we can't help but engage in it. We have to actually kind of stifle ourselves and, and kind of focus more on selfishness in, in, when, when we're in that state versus when, like naturally we give ourselves to, to good works. We want to do, we want to make a difference. We want to help. We want to serve. We want to be about what God is doing. So good works is not a cause of our salvation, but it is the fruit of having been saved. So let's make sure we're grounded on that. Now, we're going to work through these two verses. And uh, in, in doing so this morning, uh, a couple of different times here in just a little bit, Danny Needham, our missions and foster church team lead, is going to come up here and she's going to share the platform with me and help to, to communicate some of this, I think, important stuff. So go back to verse 13. Let's work through this. Verse 13 says, do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. So from this, we're going to see that each believer, each believer is to be an accelerant. Remember, an accelerant is a substance. We're the substance that speeds something on. And the something here is Jesus' mission. Each believer. Now, I could have, friends, I could have said in this main first main point that the local church is to be an accelerant to Jesus' mission. And that would be a true statement. However, there are some people who get confused. They haven't yet made the connection between the, the, the reality that the local church is made up of the people who are the local church. They, it's, you and I are the local church, right? That there isn't an institution or an organization, there isn't a labor force or a funding source beyond the people who make up the church. We are the local church. But if I said the local church is to be an accelerant to Jesus' mission, some of us would sit here and say, yeah, amen to that, and we wouldn't realize, oh, well, wait, I am the local church. Right? So I, each believer, every one of us who makes up the local church is to be an accelerant. We're supposed to be the ones engaged in, in, in speeding the process of Jesus' mission. Make sense? So here's, here's what I love about this. The standard is set in the first line. The standard is do your best. Do your best. That's what we're told. This is encouraging to me. Y- yes, the church should do its best the church as a whole, but each one of us who make up the church, we're called to do our best. And I'm glad that it doesn't say, hey, do better than everyone else. It doesn't say compare yourself to others as if it's a competition, and so long as you're doing better than some, thumbs up to you. It doesn't say that, does it? It says we're to do our best which means each one of us has to take a personal assessment of our engagement in Jesus' mission. And we have to go, am I doing my best? And when we have to go, wait a second, am I pushing my own limits? Am I stretching? Am I growing? Am I striving? Am I willing to be challenged? Am I reaching for my own potential, specifically regarding Jesus' mission and my engagement in it? It puts something to each one of us, doesn't it? It's not then just, well, you know, the local church should do that, which we would all probably, who are part of it, would say, well, sure, amen to that. But then it's each one of us. Every one of us has to, and this is the standard. It's not about what you're doing versus what somebody else is doing. It's just do your best. Praise God for that, huh? It's a challenge, but it's a, it's a, it, I think it's a, a liberating challenge. It doesn't put undue pressure on us. It's like, hey, I want to do what God's asking me to do. And this, that can't come from this platform. I can't tell you what God's asking you to do. You, that's a matter of your conscience. That's a matter of you praying and assessing and saying, God, where can I grow? How can I improve? What should I do different? And for some, God might be saying, hey, thank you. You're doing your best. Great job. And for others, it might be a different answer. It might be, hey, I really think you should, I think you should step it up. I think you should think about this, this sort of thing. Now, here's what we see. So that's the standard, but let's keep going through this verse. The condition is that we support effective laborers. We've got these two people, Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos, and they were effective laborers who were to be sped along. The churches on the island of Crete were to speed those effective laborers on. And we don't know a whole lot about Zenos, the lawyer. 
But we do know that he's partnered up with Apollos, which gives him a lot of credibility. Zenos the lawyer, a couple of things are possible. He could have been a Jewish Christian who was then a lawyer in the sense that he was an expert in the Mosaic law, which, of course, in that day, in that part of the world, was super, super useful, beneficial for the mission of Christ. Right? Probably more likely, because his name is of a Greek origin, Zenos, was probably a Gentile Christian who then, as a lawyer, would have been a Roman jurist, which was a, a professional legal specialist. And then we got Apollos. Now, we know more about Apollos because we read about him in the book of Acts and we read about him in the letter to the Corinthians. Paul wrote about him. And Apollos was a powerful teacher and preacher of the Bible. Powerful. He was from Alexandria, uh, which is in North Africa. And we're told in Acts 18 that he possessed these, just like these beautiful, two powerful, beautiful traits and, um, and we're told that he was competent in the scriptures, right? Now, for some of you, you could look at that and be like, oh, that's admirable, that's good, praise God. For somebody like me who's vocationally engaged in this sort of thing, I'm like, oh, man, that would be the greatest compliment anybody could ever give, right? That's like the best, that you're competent in the scriptures, that you have taken the Bible so serious and you have so set yourself to be a student of the Bible that others would say they're competent. Nobody's mastered this, but to be competent in it. What a compliment, right? That's awesome. And then the other side of it, the other trait that he possesses is we're told in Acts 18 that he was eloquent in the delivery. And I'm thinking, wow, this dude, I love this guy, right? This guy is awesome. He and Zenos. They're partnered up together. Both of these men, using their gifts, using their areas of expertise to engage the mission of Christ. That sounds pretty smart, doesn't it? It sounds like, it sounds like any one of us could, by way of application, insert our own names and go, what gifts do I have? How has, how has God gifted me? What talents do I have? What knowledge do I have? What areas of expertise do I have? And I should be engaging those in Christ's mission also, right? That's just, that's just smart living on the part of a Christian. This is, this is the condition that we support effective labors, and we ourselves should be some of those effective labors. So this is what we get. We've got Zenos, the Lord, and Apollos. Now, like the churches in Crete, we want to support effective missionaries. We want to support effective laborers, I should say. And, and here's the thing. There's a million options. It's, it's crazy how many options there are locally and globally of people who are carrying out Jesus' work, uh, who are missionaries or whatever. It's like, there's, how, do you, how, how, do you, how do you say no? How, who do you say yes to? We've got to figure that out, right? Well, when I say we, I mean we've, We've been working on figuring that out. We've, we've got a strategy. We've got a plan for missionaries that we say yes to. And the reality is then we've got to say no to everybody else and trust that God's going to supply for them in other ways because we can't do everything. We can do some things well, but we have to say no to a lot of things to do a few things well, right? So Danny's going to come up, and Danny's here this morning, and she's going to tell us, um, tell us how do we select the missions organizations and the missionaries that we support. How do we do that, Danny? Yeah, so we do have certain principles that we go by to select and support the missionaries that are part of City Point Church. And so the first thing that we do is we have something called an individual and collective principle. And through that, we see that happening in the New Testament church. So that's important that we're trying to emulate that, right? But what we do is that we carry that out by asking the people of City Point Church who want to give to missions above and beyond the tithe, that they do that by giving to City Point and designating that money to missions. So then from there, we have that collective pool of giving that we use, and, we, and then as leaders at City Point, we choose which missionaries that we are going to support as a church. And we do that because we feel like that's the most effective way to support missions. 
um, not only because it's biblical, mm -hmm. but also because we feel like it has the greatest impact because then as a church, we're doing more than just giving funds. We're getting to know these missionaries. We're building relationships with these missionaries. We're inviting them to the church to speak. We're praying for these missionaries on a regular basis. We're sharing those prayer requests with you as a body and hoping that you're praying for them as well. We're giving on a monthly basis to our missionaries. And then above and beyond that monthly giving, we also when there's needs, try and support those extra needs that they have. And then we're also going. We're, we're trying to send teams to support these missionaries where they're at when we can. Yeah, that's great. So individual collective, we see this in the Bible. Uh, our text, we could get that from our text, but there's other places in the Bible. And uh, so then the collective work of the church goes forward. Uh, as the individuals engage in it. So that's great. Now you talked about how we decide, then there's a leadership team, we decide which, which those missionaries are and those mission organizations. What are the parameters yeah, behind yeah. that? So we also have 80-20 principles that we go by, and we have three of those. The first is that we try to have 80% of our missionaries be part of the Northwest Ministry Network, and that is because we are affiliated with the Northwest, Northwest Ministry Network. And so that helps us to vet those missionaries well. We know that they are vetted well and that the Northwest Ministry Network is supportive of them, and so we come alongside them and support those missionaries. And then second, we have an 80-20 principle where 80% of our funds we try to send globally versus 20% locally. And the reason that we do that is because when you look, the biggest needs are outside the borders of the U.S. as far as the persecuted church, the lack of gospel access. That, not that there aren't needs within the, the U.S., right? And we try and address those as well, but we do that because we are here locally in our communities. As a church, we can do that because we are missionaries and we go out and we support those people in our communities and share the gospel in that way. Yeah. And so then the last of our 80-20 principles is a newer principle that we are trying to reach. We're not there yet, but we want 80% of our global funds to go to unreached people groups, UPGs. So Brent, can you explain what a UPG is? Yeah, so if you're familiar with missiology uh, in a global sense, you've probably heard that phrase, uh, an unreached people group or a UPG. And there's, there's varying definitions to what a UPG is, but I, I think the, the, the most accurate definition would be a, a people group who do not have access to the gospel, meaning there aren't churches there. In fact, there aren't Christians there. There aren't missionaries there. And what's scary is Danny will tell us that there's a huge swath of the human population that qualify as unreached people groups, even in our day. And so here we are, uh, we think of, uh, about ourselves, and I mean, we think, well, wh why do we have to go across the world? Why do we have to do that? There's people in our own neighborhoods that don't know Jesus. But friends, it's not a, a when we're talking about UPGs, it's not, it's not about that people are lost. If you don't know Jesus, if you've not received Christ Jesus the Lord, you're lost. So everybody's equally lost. It doesn't matter whether you're in Malaysia or Skagit Valley, but it's about access. And there's not equal access. See, the neighbors that you and I have that are, don't, know, know, don't know Jesus, they have us, right? <laughs> they have us. And they have, there's churches throughout this valley. It's, they're not without a witness, but there are people group, to hold, like huge numbers of people across the globe. They've never even heard of the name of Jesus. Right. And that's why we feel like that's urgent and we want to accelerate that. Yeah. Because there are three billion people in this world who have not heard the gospel and we don't want them to die without hearing the gospel. Yep. And right now, uh, as a country, only 1% of churches giving goes to missionaries who are trying to reach those unreached people groups. Wow. Yeah, thank you, Danny. So, so we've got to be, we're talking about being effective, right? Supporting effective laborers. And so we're, we try to be specific and, and, and strategic about supporting those that are doing that good work locally and 
globally. But those are some of the parameters. Thank you for explaining that to us, Danny. So we've got, we've got this standard that we've talked about, do your best. We've got this condition that we want to we support effective laborers. But now we've got the last of this, verse 13, we've got an objective. And that is that they're fully supplied. See what it says here? Paul puts it to Titus this way. See that they lack nothing, right? So whatever Zenos and Apollos needed for mission success, Titus was to see that they got it through the local church. That was, that was what they were called to engage in. Now, we have to remember this is in the context of everybody doing their best, right? And we have to remember that it's in the context of plural churches, not a single local church bearing the full responsibility of these missionaries being fully supplied. But the church's partner up together collectively making sure that missionaries get everything that they need. So we as a church are part of many churches supporting the many missionaries and mission organizations that we are partnered with, right? So we're to see, we're, we do our best to see that they're fully supplied, knowing that there are many others who are also doing their best to see that they're fully supplied. So here's what we believe, friends. We believe that God funds his mission. And that's a true statement, and that's a complete sentence. We believe that God funds his mission. But we could elongate that sentence by saying it th this way. We believe that God funds his mission through his people. And that is an equally true statement, but just more specific. We've got to remember where this happens. Now, Thanks be to God, we could actually elongate the sentence one more string and say we believe God funds his mission through his people and in miraculous ways. God does what we can't do, right? So we do our best. That's the standard. And we try to be strategic and smart about it, but knowing that God is the one who takes care of his mission ultimately, whether it's through us or through miraculous ways. So verse 13 tells us this. As each believer, we are to accelerate Jesus' mission. Now let's go on to verse 14. Verse 14 says this, and let our people, of course that's the church, right? The people of the church. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. So before we talked about it being an, ex an accelerant, this verse takes us a little bit further into that. Each believer here is to be devoted to Jesus' mission. Now, when we think of the word devoted, those of you that know me, you know I'm a word guy. I love words. They, amazingly, they mean things. But sometimes when we hear a word, we think we know what it means when it means something different than that. So when we think of devoted here, we typically think of something that we ought to give ourselves to, we ought to pay attention to. But this means more than that. It means to be the first in something. To be devoted here, me, it, it carries the idea of first obligation. So when we read the text and he says, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, he's saying, let our people learn to make their devotion to Christ and his mission their first obligation. The good works of supporting missions and missionaries, of engaging in missions and missionaries as believers in Christ, as followers of Jesus, that's our first obligation. Our devotion to Jesus and his mission is a first obligation for those who are followers of Christ, right? And this is what we find here. It's a learning process. It's part of discipleship, right? It doesn't come natural to us. It's something that we have to learn. We have to acquire some knowledge. We have got to acquire some skills, if you will, and maybe most importantly, the heart for such things. And this isn't just about, this isn't just about our giving. This is our whole lives. As followers of Jesus, we understand that we are to live sacrificially. Jesus said that, that if you want to live, you've got to die, right? This is, this is kingdom thinking, right? In, in, our, in our natural thinking, in the natural human thinking, you focus on my, yourself. But in the kingdom, kingdom thinking is you don't focus. You don't, you're not myopic. You're not inward focused. You look out beyond yourself. And what's amazing, as I said, when you, when you focus on the kingdom, you find yourself taken care of as well. Right? God will see to it. But this is a learning process. It's something that we have to, we have to um, grow in. Our text states it like this. Our people are to learn to devote themselves to good works. 
to acquire the knowledge, the skills, and the heart to carry out the support of Jesus' mission. So I think one of the best ways when we're talking specifically, I think this is discipleship in general, but, but when we're talking about missions and missions work specifically, one of the very best ways for an individual believer to get this learning is to go on a short-term mission. It's amazing what takes place in a kind of a, 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 an isolated period of time, a short period of time, when you get away and like allow yourself to be used, to be useful to God in that context. And so I I'm asked Danny to come back up again, and we've got um, we've got a couple of options coming up, and Danny Danny's going to tell us about that. But also, Danny, if you would tell us, kind of tell us of the maybe the impact that that going on a short-term mission can have on a person. So, in your missions booklet, you guys should have received while you walked in. There are these two little cards in there, and this has more information on the two short-term missions that we are launching this year, and so I wanted to make sure you have that because they have little QR codes on them for more information or to sign up, but first I wanted to talk to you about our CSM short-term mission that is happening. It's June 23rd through the 28th, so this is the third year that we're sending a team from our City Point Student Ministries down to Moses Lake to support light of Larson Church down there and I have gone the last two years with that team and let me tell you those kids work hard down Mm -hmm. there and they do a great job of supporting that church and we've built a relationship with them and it's just pretty incredible so um, if you have somebody who's a student then sign them up but even if you don't and you want to support that group you can go down as a leader so Put that on your calendar. So this is a great option. Try, yeah. you know, like you said, it's yeah. for City Point Student Ministries, but adults can be a part of that as well, right? So exactly. that's, that's great. Well, here's, Jordan, Pastor Jordan told us a little bit about this last night, which is really exciting. When we've gone in the past, there's been like work done on the facilities and different things like that that has been very helpful. And, and that young kind of fledgling church is just trying to find its wings. And, you know, it's hard work. And so uh, we've been able to partner with them, and that's been helpful. But this is like this this year is the most exciting because they haven't been able to start a, a ministry to children yet. Right. And their their neighborhood, their community is chock full of kids. And, and so what we're doing is we're going there, and they've already, we've been like coaching them right now. They've already recruited people to serve in their kids' ministries, and we're going to go there and train those people how to run an effective kids' ministry and give them the curriculum and the tools that they need, So, and then we'll engage with them while we're there, and then when we pull out, then they're going to continue that work. Yes. So that's like a pretty cool thing. Yeah, so if you can't go, please be praying. Be praying for kids to show up and for us to be effective in that ministry. Yeah. So second, we have a short-term mission to New Mexico coming up. That's going to be happening October 14th through the 21st. And that is a partnership with Convoy of Hope. And we're excited about that because this is a new partnership that we're building with them. And we are partnering with a local church down there this time as well. And what we're going to do is there is a community down there. It's actually called Las Vegas. Um, So a little confusing, but, (laughs) um, but They were ravaged by a wildfire in 2022, and there were over 600 homes that were destroyed in this wildfire. So, of course, they are still devastated and trying to recover, and we just want to send a team down there to be a blessing and to help them in any way we can. So that is our second mission that we're doing in 2023. And then we actually have this exciting announcement that we just announced last night for the first time, which is that we are planning a short-term mission to India Mm. summer of 2024, and that is going to be so incredible. We're going to get to go stay on the campus of the Shamalas and support them in their missions work. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, So, Danny, tell us, um, so so some of our people have gone, lots of our people have gone, but many haven't. Why should they consider, like, what's the impact? Yeah, I mean, I just think short-term missions is such an incredible opportunity to see God work in a way that rarely happens until you 
step out of your comfort zone and take a chunk of time to focus on nothing else but spreading the gospel and being a witness for Jesus. And doing that alongside, shoulder to shoulder with other Christians, it's, it's just a really unique and incredible experience. And I just want to tell you guys a short story about my family went to, the second time my family and I went to Mazatlan on a short-term mission, we were at a feeding center um, that happened to be, it's a feeding center of the children that we support down in Mazatlan, and so we were there just visiting with them. And the man who runs the feeding center, his name's Chewy, his wife's Margarita, incredible people. Um, he comes pulling up in his little truck and he starts unloading produce out of his truck. And everyone seems, you know, there's kind of a language barrier. I don't speak Spanish, unfortunately. But um, so they're unloading this produce and everyone's coming up and helping unload and people are, children are coming, running up, grabbing the produce. And, you know, it's something that they clearly knew what was going on. And so later on, I find out that this man who volunteers seven days a week, every day of the year, running this feeding center, also goes to the local Walmart once a week, and he sweeps the parking lot by hand for several hours so that, he, so that they will give him the produce that they are going to throw away, that they can't sell. And he takes that produce back to his community. This is I mean, I say community, you guys probably have a very different picture than what this is. This is dirt roads, this is one room shacks, this is children, chickens running all over the place, you know. And so a very, very needy community. Um, and so he brings that produce back and he hands it out to all of those children and families in that community. And so I just think that Anybody who goes on a short-term mission, I think if you've gone, you know when you come back, you're invigorated, you're excited, you feel like you can, do, you can serve in a way that's different. And I believe that that's because when you go somewhere and you see people who have almost nothing, giving just about everything they have and the joy that they have in doing it, it makes you realize that you can probably do more. <laughs> yes. Oh, help us, Lord, huh? Thank you, Danny. Great job, sister. It's, it's like, okay, so we're talking about devotion to Jesus' mission, right? And um, a, a learning process that we learn that this is, this is for us as believers' first obligation. And we hear stories like what Danny just told us about this guy doing this stuff in this little impoverished community down there. And I've been to India with the Shamalas. I was there back in 2009. And it's like, we want to say it's a different world. But it's not a different world. It's actually the one we live on, too. And here we are with a whole lot more than what they've got, and we could help. We can make a difference. And so, like, of course, as Christians, we would go, what can we do? Let's figure this out, right? It's a, it's a learning process, but it's also, as our text tells us, it's a priorities decision. Believers learn to devote themselves to the good works of supporting missions and missionaries, of advancing Jesus' mission. By doing so, it says in the text, they're helping cases of urgent need. Right? There's an urgency to Jesus' work. And I know, again, sometimes we hear a word and we think we got it. We know what that means. That means that there's something that requires immediate attention. It's urgent. And that's only part of the definition. When we're talking about what's in our text to help cases of urgent need, it's only part of the definition that it requires immediate attention. The other part of it is that it's indispensably necessary. That's what urgency means in our text. When we're talking about Jesus' mission, both definitions have to be kept in mind. There's an indispensable necessity to us engaging in Christ's mission. If we believe the Bible, we could conclude nothing else, right? There's an indispensable necessity. It requires immediate attention, right? So, so think about it like this. Imagine there's a woman walking down the road, and as she's walking down the road, she has a heart attack. And in the process of having a heart attack, she falls and smacks her knee on a rock, and it cuts her knee open. It's a pretty good gash. When the first responders show up, 
they're not going to treat her knee first. You can live with a hurt knee. The heart is indispensably necessary. That's what they're going to treat first. So we're friends. We're, again, we're talking about first obligation, this thing that we need to learn as followers of Jesus Christ, that there is a priorities decision that we have to pay attention to. And in Jesus' mission, the priority is sharing the gospel, right? The, the priority is us engaging, whether it's supporting missions and missionaries acro across the globe or whether it's engaging here in the local church as a mission for Christ right here. This is a priorities decision for us as followers of Christ. And other people in the world, that if they don't know God and they don't have the passion like that, that, that it doesn't even make sense to them. Why would you give yourself to that? But we know why we, we would give ourselves to that because there's an urgency to it. Because there's an eternity that's very real and Christ has died for our sins and he rose again that we might have life and we want as many people as possible to hear that. It isn't that there aren't other needs or that those needs are neglected. It's just that there are first obligations. There are things that are most important. So we prioritize time, resources, abilities, etc. And here's what we find. The last, very last phrase of our, of our text here talks about not being unfruitful. It's a productivity catalyst. Again, being devoted, each believer being devoted to Jesus' mission is a productivity catalyst. The text tells us to be engaged in good works, that we need to learn to do that so that we're not unfruitful. And this is about being unfruitful is being unproductive. And it's a, it's a statement about life, right? I don't know... Um, I don't know peop many people, really, that would just concede and say, I really don't want to be productive in life. I'd, re I'd really like to just be... Um, even people who are lazy don't necessarily want to be. There's something, they're hung up on something, right? But most people, there's a drive inside of us, as believers especially, because the Spirit of God resides in us. Like, we do not want to be idle. We don't want to tread water. We don't want to stay in neutral. We want to be productive. We want to do things that matter. We want to engage in meaningful things in this life. And this text tells us that we will be productive when we do that, when we do our best to speed missions and missionaries along. God sees to it that we are productive in that and, I think, in other areas of life as well. I think there's a bleed over between when we engage in missions, what happens in the rest of our lives? This is that priorities decision, and when we prioritize properly and we're devoted as we should be, it bleeds over into other areas of our lives in productive ways as well. You go, is it, that seems like maybe a stretch. Is that true? Well, Jesus said something like that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he said this, but seek first the kingdom of God. He's talking to his followers. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He's talking about how the people in the world, they focus on their needs. They, that's their focus, what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're going to wear. That's their focus. That's what they give themselves to. Jesus says, don't do that. Life is more than that. You seek the kingdom and the righteousness of God. And when you do that, God will see that you get all the things that you need. This is the, what I'm talking about. It's a productivity catalyst. Seek the kingdom. Engage, first obligation, and what, what happens is all those other things, somehow God sees to it that those are taken care of as well. Too often we want God to get with our program, right? We just think, God, I've got all these needs, I've got these things going on, and I want you to get with my program. But that's not really the best approach, is it? So we need to get, to, we need to get with God's program because when we get with God's program, it increases our own productivity. We seek His blessing. But what we really need to do is seek his kingdom. Because when we seek his kingdom, we get his blessing. Right? That's kingdom thinking, friends. Those are kingdom principles. Don't seek his blessing. Seek his kingdom. Because when you seek his kingdom, you get his blessing. Now, speeding missions and missionaries along. It's part of that. Being a catalyst to our own productivity. Devoted to Jesus. This is what we find, right? Accelerant to Jesus' mission, devoted to Jesus' mission. It's about learning, it's about priorities, it's about productivity, our big idea. We accelerate Jesus' mission. God has seen to take his people, his children, 
and bringing them into his family. He incorporates them into the family business. And we are the ones who are partnered with Jesus. God affords us the privilege of being partnered with him to support those who are engaged in his mission, both here and abroad. Now, let me just, let me just wrap this up like this. If I, were, if I were to say to you, I feel the need, which this is the title of the sermon, right? If I say to you, I feel the need, could you finish the sentence? I know, you're like, do I think like, should I say that? I'm not sure if I should say that. Yeah, that's what you're meant to say, right? I feel the need, the need for speed. Yeah, Maverick said that, but I'll tell you who else has said that. Every missionary ever. They've given their lives to go to places that you and I aren't going to go. And they've sacrificed mountains in order to be obedient to what God has called them to. And they're not individuals. They're part of the church. And for every goer, it requires a lot of people who are senders. We are part of what they're doing when we partner with them. And knowing and praying and giving and when opportunity comes, going. Every missionary ever has felt the need to be sped along. And my prayer is that we would feel the need to speed them along. So I've got a, a quick quiz for you. Regarding the good works of supporting those engaged in Jesus' mission, which is what our text calls us to. Regarding these good works, multiple choice, A, B, C, or D. A, are you doing nothing? B, doing a little. C, doing more than others. Or D, doing your best. Well, the text calls us to doing our best, right? And my best may not even measure on your scale. Your best is not supposed to be compared to anybody else's. But you and I are called to do our best. So I want to give you a couple of ways, several ways, that you could move forward forward, do, toward doing your best. The first one is relatively simple. It's to keep that missions booklet and keep it in front of you. Get familiar with it. Each one of our missionaries that we support in there, when I say we support, we send them resources, money, every single month. We take on special projects with them. We partner with them in other ways. Each one of those is supported by in this individual collective effort that Danny told us about. Right? So keep the booklet in front of you. That'll, in, way, in, in some ways, it'll keep your heart warm toward what God is doing and what he wants you to do. Secondly is to write an encouraging note to someone in the booklet. Now, in each one of those booklets, I understand there's a thank you card, just a little note, that you, a card that you can write a note of encouragement. And what I would ask you to do is don't leave this morning until you've re- just choose one of the missionaries in the booklet and say, dear so-and-so, and then just write them a note of encouragement. Thank you for engaging. We're partnered with you. You're not alone. However you're going to say that, and just sign your, you could just sign your first name. And there's some baskets out in the lobby, by the main, in the main lobby, by the front doors. You could just drop the card in the baskets, and we'll mail them out this next week. So that'd be a second thing. Third is the obvious, pray regularly. Pray regularly. That's why the missions book is put out. We also have ways for you to pray, so you can, so you can become a more skilled prayer We've got a missions newsletter that goes out every single month that will help with that, kind of populate your, your prayers. That's important work. Every missionary will tell you that. It's not a platitude. They need our prayers. 
Number four, also maybe a given is to give monthly to missions. As Danny said, it's above and beyond the tithe. It's designated giving that goes specifically and only to missions work. Give it through City Point Church for maximum impact. Number five, I think is really important because it's a mindset, right? Join a City Point Church team. Every one of our ministries, whether you're talking about our Awana ministry or Foster Church or City Point Kids or City Point Student Ministries or working in the cafe or I could just keep listing them. Every single one of our ministries is part of the mission of Christ. Some opportunities are a weekly thing. Some opportunities are monthly. Some of them are periodic. But join a team. There's opportunities to serve because we are part of Jesus' mission. We're not his mission. We're just part of his mission. But we want to be engaged in this. So if you're not on a team, join a team. Get involved. Allow God to take your gifts and your skills and your expertise and put it to work through the local church. Number six is to go on a short-term mission. And the last one, the last one's maybe a little bit different. I'll explain this to you. In the second quarter of this year, which we're in now, one of my objectives as, as the lead pastor here is to formulate, to really refine and improve our approach in bringing the gospel to this community. I don't feel like we're doing as good a job as we could. Uh, I'm not like discouraged or disappointed, but I feel like we could do better. As we've grown, as we've matured as a church, I think we can do better. I think we can accelerate from where we're at. And so I want to invite you, if you would care to be invited, I'd like to invite you into the conversation. So sometime in this second quarter, I'm going to um, host a lunch and just sit down with anybody that wants to that's part of the church and j- just have a dialogue like what are some ways that we can more effectively bring the gospel to this community and um, and I'd love I'd love to hear your mind on it and so if you're interested in that uh, in any of these the connect card is the thing to use uh, for that just just write Number seven, I want to be, you know, in, in this uh, conversation. And, and, um, and we'll make sure and get the, keep you on the list and get the word out to you. What I'd ask you not to do is come up to me after the gathering and say, hey, I want to be in that. <laughs> because as much as I'd love to remember that, um, I've got limited capacities. And some of you would go, yeah, they're very limited. And I go, okay, I get it, right? <laughs> Be better to use your connect card. (laughs) Yeah, so praise God. Let's stand together. I want to pray for us. Thank you, Lord. God, I give you praise for City Point Church. Every boy and girl, every man and woman, I thank you, God, for them so glad to be partnered up with this church family. And I pray, God, that you will speak to each one of us. Help us to reflect and to hear from you as to what our best is. Because, Lord, truly, we want to honor you. As your children, we are great, our deep desire is to please you and to honor you. And your word tells us to be devoted to good works, to do our best in this regard. And so I pray that you will speak to us and guide us in this way. I pray that you will help us to be accelerants, to speed Jesus' mission along. And if that's your prayer, could you say amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. It's so great to be a part of the church, huh? I love City Point Church. Praise God. Now, you're going to go with this thought. Whether you're fully aware of it or not, God is equipping you with everything good so that you can do His will. And He's working in you that which is pleasing to Him. Praise God for that. God bless you, church.